And I've tried to lay the, a little bit of the groundwork that there's another side to motion, rotational motion. And in talking about rotational motion, I tried to, uh, I don't know, bring up the similarities, that there's a common vocabulary between the two. That, you know, if we have angular, I'm sorry, we have linear velocity, we also have angular velocity. If we have linear acceleration, we have angular acceleration. And try to, to make the comparison that for everything that we did for translational motion, we have a equal counterpoint for rotational motion. Well, yesterday was also trying to bridge the gap because in having this conversation, there's also this idea that if you're trying to get something to move, the causes of motion are forces. And that if you have unbalanced forces acting on your object, it will accelerate. And the amount of that acceleration will depend upon the inertia of the object. Moreover, if you can apply a force, it is possible that that force could do work and change the object's energy. If it did, you might be able to imbue that object with kinetic energy because it might be moving after you've done work. In fact, we had a work energy theorem, which said that if you do work, you could change the object's kinetic energy. However, changing its kinetic energy required a force, and that force would be tempered by the object's inertia. So you do the same amount of work on two objects, but one object is bigger than the other. Well, one object might not be going as fast as the other. They may have the same amount of energy, but because the bigger object is harder to move, it doesn't move as fast as a smaller object. Right? We've talked about energy, making comparisons. We also talked about impulse. Impulse being how you would change an object's momentum. And we define that momentum, again, based on the object's inertia. So although yesterday was a conversation about inertia, We've had conversations about inertia. And I've tried to also implicate you in understanding that if you understand inertia, you can sound like you know what you're talking about. Doing work changes an object's energy. How much it changes depends on the work you do. But how that's reflected and how fast it goes depends on how much inertia the object has. Objects with more inertia are harder to move than objects with less inertia. They don't move as much for the same amount of energy. Try to make those kinds of statements very clear and use the word inertia as much as possible. Well, now we have things that rotate. And we defined how to get something to rotate. But it was more complicated than just a force. Applying a force just meant pushing on the object. Applying a torque meant how you pushed on the object. Suddenly, where you pushed on the object mattered, and the angle that you applied to the object also mattered. Applying a torque was more complicated because it depended on the shape and size of the object. Why some of you still can't exit the room. Now, it should be kind of clear to you that there's a future here that's going to have some similarities, where the rest of this box is going to be full of things that have to do with what happens when you have unbalanced torque. Last week was about balanced torque. We did statics. So uh, there was no need to worry about the object's inertia because it wasn't moving. But what happens when the unbalanced torque isn't zero? What happens when we suddenly have an unbalanced torque on an object? Well, I think it should be clear that an unbalanced torque is going to lead to an acceleration in the same way that an unbalanced force leads to an acceleration. Well, how this object accelerates is going to depend on its inertia. But this time we're talking about the moment of inertia. So the rotational inertia of the object, separate and distinct from its translational inertia. 
right, how the object is shaped now plays a role in determining how it behaves. All the first semester, our objects were point masses. We didn't care how they were shaped. Second semester, our objects have shape. Their shape determines how they behave. I think you could probably imagine fleshing this out, right? There are similarities between these. It shouldn't be a surprise that there's likely a definition of work that deals with torque. Something similar to the way in which we deal with force. If work being done on an object required a force over a displacement, then work being done by a torque probably requires an angular displacement. It is very plausible that you could change an object's kinetic energy. Do you think rotating objects have kinetic energy? Are they moving? Is any part of their mass moving? If it is, then you can probably imagine that their kinetic energy has a similar structure to the kinetic energy of an object that's just going in a straight line. In fact, it should not be a surprise to you that if you throw a, a baseball or a frisbee or a football, if it's spinning and changing location at the same time, it probably has two kinds of energy. One to describe its change in location and one to describe its rotational speed. And it should not be implausible that there are impulses for rotational motion where a torque could be applied for some amount of time and that it would change the angular momentum of the object. Capital L is angular momentum. We'll be coming to that. But it shouldn't be a stretch to say that angular momentum is going to have something to do with the object's inertia. Inertia plays a role in the three biggest rules of first semester. Force, energy, and momentum. So inertia is going to play a role in the three biggest topics of second semester. Again, force energy, and momentum. The three basic ideas are all dependent on inertia. Yesterday, we to try and get all this out. Time, you need to employ something from here. If there's an I in it, well, you've probably got more than one step. Just like every time we had a torque, we had to reason out what the torque was. Every time there's an I, you're going to have to reason out what you should use for I. It's going to be a little bit more work. I know you guys are deaf. I put together this chart for you. I want to reiterate it because today we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Do you remember this chart? I had five things on this chart. I talked about the fact that if you had a, a rod that was L long and mass M, that depending on how you spun this, we determine what moment of inertia you should use. And I talk specifically about two ways to spin it, once about its center and once about its end. But about its end, the moment of inertia was one-third, ml squared. About its center, the moment of inertia, one-twelfth, ml squared. And then we went on to other shapes, right? Talked about rings and disks and hollow spheres and spheres. And although... You may not need to write these things down because you have them in your notes. There's something I want to impress upon you about this. The first is that the rod extends to lots of things. I all talked about the fact that the rod could be the door, right? That the door is a rod about one end. That we treat it that way because this object could be three-dimensional but we only care about the distance of the mass away from the axis of rotation. So whether the rod is very skinny or very long, it still behaves the same. That can be said about the ring. The ring could be a, a really crappy drawn tube, right? or a long hollow pipe. It would still be just a ring. So although this ring has radius and mass, the moment of inertia of a ring is mr squared. 
without extensive a ring that's really long too. So a toilet paper tube or a PVC pipe. A disc, well, there's the idea that the disc has a radius and a mass, but the disc also could be a long solid cylinder. That would also be a, a disc. It wouldn't matter that it's long. The mass is still distributed the same way about the center. So if you're rotating this about its center, it would have a moment of inertia of one half mr squared. So although we said disc, we also mean, you know, solid cylinder. Of course, this could also be a solid cylinder if you're spinning it about one end. A solid cylinder that's super, super long. If you're spinning it like a rod, then it would be a, it would be a, a rod. It wouldn't be a cylinder. How you spin these things determines which moment of inertia to use. I put two more, and I'm just rounding this out to make sure that we have an understanding that I expect you to know these. And although there's no requirement to memorize them, it's in your best interest to know them. It will make everything happen so much faster for you. And it's not really knowing very much. If you've figured it out yet, they all are basically the same, just with a different fraction out front. Have you noticed that? All you have to really memorize are the fractions. They're all ML squared or MR squared. It shouldn't be too hard to realize that the smaller one here is based on the fact that you're spinning it about the center. This one's going to be bigger because you're spinning it about the end. More of the mass is further away from the axis of rotation. Now, I bring this up because that means I also want you to have a, an idea of where these numbers are coming from. So we're going to do a little activity to show you where these numbers are coming from. This is where... Or a ball, something that is two-dimensional. Because how do you break the disc up into pieces? I want you to imagine how... That might be tough, right? Like, if I have a piece, what do I do? Do I say, this piece right here? You know, there's... How many pieces would we break it up into? That might be kind of challenging if you can probably see that. Two-dimensional pieces might be tough. There's a way to do it, and in mechanics we do it. But here, I want you to have an appreciation for the way it's done. All of these, though, derived from calculus. Even this one, really. But you should understand why this one doesn't really require calculus. Those of you who are paying attention understand that every piece of mass, no matter which piece I choose, do you notice that it's the same distance away from the center? That's why the whole thing is mr squared. Every piece is a distance r squared away. That's why the ring is mr squared. And yes, I expect you to be able to explain that on a test. Um, yesterday. And for today, I'm going to take a, a rod, and we're going to break the rod up into pieces. And I think I was talking about doing this as a meter stick yesterday. I'm not going to. I'm going to say the rod has ma length L and mass M. And we're going to spin it about one end. I'm sure that I talked to you about the fact that we're going to use something called the point mass moment of inertia. Did I bring that up at the end of class yesterday? I asked if you guys knew how to use a summation. And you guys had this dubious look on your face. This is the summation for moment of inertia. Now, it says something very specific, even if you don't understand what it says. First, a summation says that you're going to be breaking or using multiple things in your sum. So we label them and give each one of those pieces a number. If you have lots of things you're adding together, then you'll need to count them all up and know how many ahead of time you're going to be adding together. We tell the summation that we're going to start with object number perhaps one. You might start with number five. I don't know. Depends on what you're adding together. We're going to do moment of inertia. So we're going to add up all the pieces of the object that's rotating. And we're going to go. Oh, I see. That's not an N. Sorry. I. 
because it's item number. We're going to start at item number one. And we're going to go all the way until we've gotten all the pieces of the object. But I don't know how many pieces there are, so I'm just going to put an end there. This is generic. It says, if you want to find the moment of inertia of an object, then you need to add up each object, each part of the object. And you have to not only add up each piece, this represents the mass of a piece of the object. It's not enough because we're supposed to be figuring out how the shape affects its inertia. So this value represents the perpendicular distance. From the piece to the axis of rotation. Now, this is called a point mass formula because you can use this for point masses, meaning individual pieces of an object. But also, you could take an object like this bar and you could break it up into pieces. Now, this will not give us the exact answer. It's an estimate. It's a way of estimating an object's moment of inertia. But I want you to see where moment of inertia comes from. So we're going to take the bar that we have here and we're going to break it up into four equal size pieces. So I'll divide it in half, and each piece I'll divide in half. And we're going to find a moment of inertia of all four pieces. Now to do that, I want to be really careful. We're going to state that this bar is of uniform density. So each piece's center of mass is at its center. So I'm going to put a couple of dots here to represent the centers of each piece. We're going to find the moment of inertia by adding together all the pieces. So I want to build a summation that tells me that. First, my moment of inertia is going to be a sum of each piece of mass and how far away it is from the axis of rotation. I'm going to start at piece number one and end at piece number four because there are four pieces. In fact, I'm going to organize and say this is piece number one, this is piece number two, this is piece number three, this is piece number four. It's important that I break the pieces up into uniform parts, if I can. Sometimes you can't, but if you can, it's, it's appropriate. Now, this is sum. So for each piece, I need to find mr squared and then add it to every other piece. And to do this, I'm going to use the information that's presented here. So I'm going to be adding four things together. Let's talk about piece number one. What is the mass of piece number one? All right, I took my whole thing and broke it into four pieces. So my piece of mass number one is one-fourth m. Good. Now, how far away is that piece from the axis of rotation? Go ahead. Nope, it's not a meter stick. Hey, folks, um, don't make this hard. Uh, if there's four pieces and I put a dot at the center of each piece, I'd say there's one, two, three, four, five, six. We've broken it up into eight sections. How far is the first dot from the edge? An eighth of the whole thing? Don't make it hard. It's pretty visual, isn't it? If the whole thing is L, then this length right here from the first dot so the axis of rotation is going to have to be one-eighth L. But that quantity is squared. Now, I'm of a mind that once we get over that hurdle, you could do the other three pieces. But first period proved me wrong. 
And there was many people who could not do this. Let's see who can. I'm going to walk a few thoughts. There's not a whole lot of thought here, though. I mean, I, I think we all can probably imagine now that we know the next mass is one fourth m. I saw all the people erasing the threes and the fives. Because the one of you who went to five fourths m, I thought that was funny because the whole thing's mass is just m. Now, where is this one? Well, it's this far away from the axis of rotation. I count three sections. So three eighths m. I'm sorry, three eighths l. Quantity squared. Now, I, I think that the next two are pretty recursive. I'm saying that word because some of you know what recursive relationships are. Are you seeing that there is a recursive relationship, a pattern to our relationship? So although the next piece will be one quarter M, what's this length? Sure, we're, we're hitting all the uh, odd numbers, aren't we? And our last one. Now, being a nerd like I am, I, I like stuff like this because there's patterns in numbers. And if you understand that, there's kind of neat things in those patterns. Now, if you're not that person, okay, I don't care. But I, I find the idea of looking for patterns to be interesting. Uh, I also notice that I can pull out a one of those from everything. Do you see that? And what's left inside is just four fractions. One sixty-fourth plus 9 64ths plus 25 64ths plus 49 64ths. Right, it's just simple third grade fractions now and not so terrible fractions in that they all have the same denominator. I didn't even make you do common denominators here. Fascinating. What is this all equal? Can you do all that? I mean, if you want to do it in steps, you can. I don't know why you would have to, but this will be 84 over 64. But you have this one-fourth out front. 84 divided by 4 is 21. So this is 21 64ths ml squared. First thing I want to point out is it's not a third. We expected that we'd find this to be a third. Do you realize how close it is to a third, though? Are you sure? Because I think some of you are saying that, but you could do 21 divided by 64 to see. But do you understand that one third is 21 63s? And our number is 21 64. I'd say we're really close. This is an estimate. Why isn't it perfect? Because part of the, uh, the mass is here and part of the mass is here, but we said the whole mass for that piece was there. It's not perfect. Clearly, to get better, we'd have to break it into more pieces. You know, I bet if we broke it into 10 pieces, we'd get really close. Of course, that'd be a lot more work, wouldn't it? Repetitive work, sure. Um, I, I want to make sure you guys are getting this. So before I move on, uh, you need to do one on your own. And yeah, I feel like I should test this, like maybe call one of you out put you on the spot, be a jerk, because I'm afraid I have a lot of autopilot here. Can you do this whole thing again from the center? In some ways, this one's easier. But I bet you screw it up. is whatever the fraction is going to be. Don't we, would we all be able to kind of agree that it's going to be something ML squared? So I can pick anybody. Paige, what'd you get? You don't know yet? 
then you have to offer up a sacrifice from your table. Wow. Now we know. And now you know. <laughs> Do you have it? Okay, so you have their pieces. Let's, let's go through the pieces then. So you did one-fourth M times three-eighths L squared. Okay. Okay, so one-fourth M times one-eighth L squared. Next one is also one-eighth. And what's the last one? So we could just do this times two. Is that right? Now, the thing is, it's the same on both sides, and it's a sum. So you can do that. We're just adding pieces together, and there will be two contributions that are an eighth away and two contributions that are three-eighths of away. Follow so far? So you work all that out, and I think you get 564 ml squared. That's what you should expect to get. Is that 1 12th? Well, no. 5 60th would be 1 12th. Is it close to 1 12th? Not as close as last time, is it? Well, that's because, believe it or not, this was less accurate because we really only broke it up into two pieces that we used twice as opposed to breaking it up into four pieces. So it's less accurate with the fewer number of pieces. The more pieces you have, the more accurate it is. Now, I want you to understand that you will not really have to do this kind of stuff. I did this for one reason and one reason only. So when you guys ask me about this at tutoring, the next time we have tutoring, and I shut you down because I'm being a jerk, it's not because I'm being a jerk. It's because I'm saying this, but you don't actually hear me. I wanted you to know where moments of inertia come from. Your ability to do this will not be tested. You should know where they come from. You should be able to describe this. And you should be able to describe the process that we go through to calculate a moment of inertia. You should indicate why this piece contributes more to the moment of inertia than this piece does. And it has to do with the fact of its distance being further away. And with center of mass, we always knew that pieces that were further away contributed more. But with moment of inertia, that value is squared. They contribute a lot more to the moment of inertia. Now, there is a type of math that will allow us to break this into a lot of parts. But that involves transitioning from this kind of sum to this kind of sum. Now, some of you are going to make this transition. Some of you are making that transition now. Some of you might never make this transition. Um, but going from this type of sum to here means going to calculus. Calculus, by definition, will break this up into an infinite number of pieces. And that's what the whole idea of calculus is. Now, you won't learn calculus that can do this. You're going to learn the basics of calculus. Applying calculus to do something like this takes a little bit more. But if you use calculus to do this, you get the one-third ml squared. And you get one-twelfth, and you get everything else. It's also how you can do things. I'm trying to emphasize that moment of inertia is a sum. I'm not sure how successful I'm being, so I'm going to show you something else. Three rods spun about their center. Hmm. Pretty sure. And it could be four, but we're just going to do three. One, two, three. It's four. Want to do four instead? Let's do the real thing. So there's four. Okay? And if you don't like it, you know who to blame. It's actually easier for me to draw four. So.
All right, so I've got my four rods, and we're going to say that each rod is mass m. Now, before we start throwing out there that they're all length l, I think that we should be considerate of something. We're putting a ring around the outside, right? I think that the rods are length 2r. You follow me on that? I mean, they might, if they were numbers, we would probably recognize that their length is one, is two times a radius. So I'm going to say that their length is 2r. And let's say the hoop around the outside edge is also the same mass as one of the runs. Okay? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So the hoop itself has mass m. Each support is also mass m. And we're going to find out the moment of inertia of this composite object. This is a skill I want you to have. So first, moment of inertia of a rod spun about its middle. We already have an expression for that. 1 12th m, not l here, 2r squared. And how many of those are there? Four, so times four. Right, they're all the same. Doesn't matter how they're mounted here. They're all the same. They're all being spun about their middle. I also have the moment of inertia of a ring spun about its center. We know that to be m r squared. So the moment of inertia of our object, the wheel, Can you do that? I'll help you out. MR squared is going to be out here, but I think there's going to be a fraction. Only got like three minutes, so we got to get there. Four times four is 16. 16 twelfths is four thirds. Four thirds plus one is seven thirds. I get seven thirds MR squared. You might have, I don't know, two and a third, or maybe you did, you know, 2.33. I would leave it as a fraction. Now, help me out here. What's the mass of the object? Yeah? 5M. Five 5M. Five M. I'm not trying to trick you. There are five objects being added together. They all have mass M. So if I take this wheel and just chuck it across the room, well, its kinetic energy would be 1 half times 5M times V squared. But that would be its kinetic energy. I would use its mass here. If I just hold it in place and spin it, well, then its kinetic energy is going to be one-half seven-thirds mR squared times its speed squared. This would be its rotational kinetic energy if I spin it. This is its translational kinetic energy if I chuck it. I could do both at once, right? I could throw it like a Frisbee. If I throw it like a Frisbee, it'll have a rotational kinetic energy because it's spinning and a translational kinetic energy because it's traveling from one place to another. It could have both. Everybody good so far? If I asked you what the total kinetic energy is, then you just add those together because energies add together. Now, listen closely, please, because I know the bell rings in a minute. If it's rolling, that's a special circumstance. You can 
spin and change location, and they can be completely separate. But rolling requires this to be true. Rolling is a special circumstance that requires both velocities to be linked together. Now, understanding the difference between something that is moving and spinning and rolling is going to be a critical piece of understanding. Also, if you look carefully, you might notice something happens when we deal with situations with rolling, especially a wheel. I just did simple substitution here. Right? I just did simple substitution. If we say the wheel is rolling, then we get to do simple substitution. Do you notice what happens under that circumstance? I'm not sure if you see it, but you should. I have an R squared here, and I'm going to have an R squared here. In situations where things are rolling, we will often make this substitution and get the energy in terms of either how fast the thing is moving or how fast the thing is spinning. But you'll notice that R drops out. That happens frequently in these kinds of problems. You should be looking for it. But that's only when we are under the condition of rolling.